Welcome back to Big Griff Energy. This is episode 20. It will be airing on Thursday, June 22nd. We are safe and sound from our European adventure and our UK adventure. And I'm diving right back into the fire. Um, Pre-orders for our new album, Ghost at the Gallows, are live now. Go to spiritadrift.com. You can get it from Century Media. You can get it from Evil Greed if you're in Europe. You can get it from Revolver. Uh, Night Shift merch for North America. Those are all the limited variants. And the vinyl and CD versions have... It's... The physical release is really cool. Uh, the vinyl has like a 12 by 12 booklet. Every song has its own artwork and you get the lyrics and everything like that. It's a really cool presentation. So if you're into physical music, it's a good one. It's going to be worth having. Uh, also, we're doing a merch sale right now, spiritadrift.bigcartel.com. We have some new designs and some older designs discounted and you get free rolling papers with every order. So that's what's going on right now. Uh, yeah, this is Aaron Thursday. So today I'm going into the studio, um, starting to do interviews for the new record. It finally feels like we have a new record coming out and yeah, just right back into the fire. Uh, I'm going to be in the studio later today working on a new, Spirit of Drift related project. And that's what's going on. Uh, We have a new song out called Barn Burner with a music video that came out real cool. I'm very happy with how it came out. Uh, We worked with this guy, Wombat Fire, and he nailed it. And he also did another music video for a song that's not out yet, but that'll be coming out, I think, the day of the album release. But the barn burner video is very cool. We're all very, very happy with it. And I got an email from Shep from Michigan regarding that song. So I guess I'll start there. Um, So Shep came out and saw us twice on the COC tour. Was one of these diehards that reminds me of me when I was younger. She knew like every word. Uh, right in the front knew like every guitar part air guitar and and stuff and I had her pick what song we closed with in uh, Flint Michigan and then in Grand Rapids she ditched work to come see us again drove like whatever five six hours or something so I let her pick I think two songs that day it was a lot of fun but so Shep wrote and said uh just wanted to write and say that I'm really digging the podcast and appreciate the transparency in your own personal stories, as well as regarding the industry. I got in a spirit of drift around when Divided came out, actually when a friend mentioned it in a gate creeper conversation. You guys really hit a sweet spot for my thin Lizzie loving heart. And then in parentheses, you guys got to crack out waiting for an alibi live. Not many folks are playing thin Lizzie these days. I don't know if I could play that song live, to be honest. That's guitar stuff is hard. I'm sure Tom could, but... I don't know. Anyway, she says, uh, it was an honor to see y'all play live with COC. Thanks for letting me pick a song or two back in November. Divided was the first track I heard from you guys. So uh, it was cool to have it come full circle. I think that's one of the ones she chose for us to play. A few episodes ago, you talked about reading the signs and omens of the physical world, especially regarding the owls. We have very similar world observations as I'm a firm believer in listening to signs and things that my proverbial higher power points my way. Although sometimes, as I'm sure you've experienced, it can be both a cryptic and humbling experience. That being said, when you do get a sign, one that you know is in front of you for a reason and is more or less proof of cause, you know you're on this planet doing the right thing. I bring this up because funny enough, barn burner is actually one of those signs I recently taken to a career in wild land firefighting and I'm wrapping up a degree in forestry school. As I've recently uncovered in my own faith, fire is a huge aspect of not only my life, but so significant to the world around me. Having a song to yell, light your torches is fucking euphoric. Born into fire is in the same vein as well as most of divided really and enlightened too. 
obviously you've written the words in your own context, but I know that they are so malleable, but know that they are so malleable and moving. I know Ghost at the Gallows is long awaited for you guys, and the lineup you've put together is something special. You mentioned No Country for Old Men being a definitive film for the feeling of the record, and what better example of fate, Outlaws, and the feeling of the Old West. I'm on a road trip next year following Metallica around on their stadium tour, and look forward to passing through the region that defines your sound and soul, and I'll get to visit a Bucky's. I uh, hope you guys have a rocking time in Europe and get some well-deserved rest. Looking forward to hearing the rest of the record. So there's a few things that hit me there. The the signs thing. One of the first of all, that's awesome. I love when that happens. That's you know synchronicity. Uh, Spirit Adrift has been like a hub of synchronicity in my life. Synchronicity is basically a fancy mystical word for coincidences, but it's you know it sort of goes beyond coincidence. It's almost like a repeatable a repeatable, um, meaningful coincidence that seems to occur over and over. And that happens a lot with, with spirit adrift. It always has it. Like when Jeff was in the band, we had a lot of that going on. One of the things for me has actually been rain. So that's cool that you got fire. Uh, obviously both very elemental things, but there's been a lot of people involved in Spirit of Drift uh, who I eventually tell, like, yeah, when when significant stuff happens with this band, it'll always rain. Even if it's like a completely clear sky and there's no rain forecast, it'll rain out of the blue. And non-believers, hardline atheists, all kinds of people, everybody that's been around for any extended period of time has seen that. And even the most firm non-believers are kind of like taken aback by it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. I don't know what it means. I, Shep said something about knowing that you're on the right path. I kind of just look at it like that. Like, it's just a little signal of like, yeah, this is what you're supposed to be doing, writing these songs, doing this, not giving up, you know, making music, whatever. And uh, Shep, if you feel like your purpose is to be out in the woods fighting fires and stuff like that and studying that, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I, I feel like if you're open to that sort of thing, you will get um, you will get little indicators that you're on the right path. And you'll get indicators that you're on the wrong path, too. I, I believe in that, too. I've experienced that as well. Um, there was another... Another aspect of this, okay, the words being malleable. That's a big, big thing for me. Um, all my favorite songwriters, I think that's a goal for them. Uh, Tom Petty talked all the time about, you know, sharing, sharing your human experience, but not doing it so specifically that it's hard for other people to relate to. Uh, and using broad language and telling your story in a way that is real, like universal enough so that the most amount of people who are listening to it can relate to it. Cause that's what this is all about. I harp on that all the time, the human connection. So even the lyrics of mine that are like pretty uh, cliche metal mystical whatever warrior stuff on surface level none of it's really about any sort of lord of the rings type crap or uh you know typical metal subject matter it's a lot of that language is good for imagery for this style of music but uh yeah i mean every song i write has a has some kind of deeper personal meaning that's usually conveyed through metaphor and, and broad language and, and stuff like that. So yeah, I think it's important to use malleable lyrics in the songs. Uh, what else talking about no country for old men. It's funny. I watched that movie on the, on the flight home from Europe and following Metallica around. Very cool. Very cool. That's like a becoming a great American pastime, I think. So thanks for the, uh, 
the email Shep, you are a real fan of music. And I wish there were a lot more people like you out there that were as passionate. Uh, so keep it up. I'm going to tell a little story about uh, the writing of Barn Burner too. So that's our new single. It's out now. I, I had a, uh, I had seven or eight songs that I had shared with the label, just demos. And we got on a call and, um, our, and I, our guy at century media who I love, uh, and treasure, he made some comment and I don't know if this was like part of some scheme that he had, but he said something about, you know, he was like, these are good. These are good songs, but I'm not hearing like a ride into the light just yet. And granted, these songs were in demo form, right? And they weren't even close to being done. And I think Ride Into the Light's our most popular song. Uh, and I think it's one of our best songs. So that's sort of like the standard. But he said something about like, yeah, these are good. These are good. But I'm not hearing a ride into the light or a wake up or, or whatever. And man, I got fucking pissed off at that. <laughs> I got really pissed. And I've never told him this. Uh, and Gitter, I don't know if you listen to this or not, but um, as soon as I got off that call, <laughs> I grabbed my red SG, which was sitting there in E flat standard tuning. And I was like, I'll show this motherfucker that, you know, it. So if that was intentional on his part, it really worked. I sat and um, I swear I wrote barn burner from start to finish. I wrote the intro the next thing I knew, I had my little transitional riffs into the verse, and then I had a little riff break in between the verses, and then I had a chorus. Then I had a thrash metal, cool mosh part. Then I had like a whole guitar harmony, weird hillbilly music uh, bridge, I guess you would say. And then I had the outro, and the song was done. I, I literally, the song is four or something minutes. It probably took me eight minutes to write that song start to finish. Uh, so maybe he's the best a and R guy in the world. Okay. It could be, I don't know if that was his plan, but, uh, either way that, that comment that he made worked. And so I have to, I have to give, give credit to my buddy Gitter for the existence of barn burner. Good job, buddy. <laughs> we did it. Uh, so yeah, that song, it's, um, I think it's very much a reflection of me cutting my teeth in the mid South in the two thousands. You know, uh, I love bands like Mastodon, Baroness, Wake from Little Rock, R W A K E, who have spoken about at length. Uh, Dead Bird, Paul Bearer came a little bit later. Uh, bands like Sea Hag from Little Rock, Kylesa, and. I, I love all those bands to this day, but I really prefer the early stuff because I was there. I was like 18 years old in Arkansas when all that stuff was coming up. I think I was 15 when the first Mastodon record came out. And I love how heavy the early material of those bands is. You know, there's like borderline Morbid Angel riffs and Slayer riffs on the early Mastodon stuff. Uh, my favorite Baroness album is the red album still. I love the blue one, but I, the red one, you know, my wife and I saw them on that last tour when they were playing for three hours or whatever. And it was a phenomenal show from start to finish. But the stuff from the red album was just like so, so heavy. And I have such a, such an emotional attachment to it because I was still young, you know, and bright eyed and, and optimistic and just like really into going to shows and listening to music when that stuff was coming out. And so I think barn burner really is a reflection of, of that. Uh, and a lot of that music, I remember wake on their MySpace page. They said uh, their influences were like the blues, black metal and bluegrass, you know, <laughs> like connecting all of those seemingly disparate, uh, styles of music but if you listen to the guitar work and stuff it's it's very progressive but it's almost informed by like banjo playing in traditional Appalachian music uh, same with that early Mastodon and early Baroness you know there's a lot of 
banjo lines being played on distorted guitar. And uh, I didn't put any thought into the music of Barnburner. Like I said, I just sat down and wrote it start to finish. But I think that's what was coming out. Like Shep said, that the South is what defined my sound as a musician and my soul as a person and a musician. That's very true. And Barnburner is definitely a reflection of that. So that's kind of where that song came from. Uh, that show Midnight Mass had just come out too. I love Mike Flanagan. I feel like very kindred spirits with him. Uh, I think he's the greatest horror writer and director, one of the greatest filmmakers of a generation, uh, if not all time, really in the horror genre. And he made Midnight Mass. I had just watched it around that time. And some of the themes of that sort of melded with some uh, some real life issues that are very frustrating and demoralizing to me. And so that's where the lyrics came from. Uh, I don't want to get too into those because as Shep mentioned, the lyrics are malleable and I intentionally uh, wrote it to where the mo the largest amount of human beings would be able to relate to it and feel something from it. Uh, so that's barn burner. Yeah, it's out now. It's man. That's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. It really is. I think it's like uh very different for us. It's like a real, yeah, it's just a reflection of, of the s most extreme end of the Southern influence of spirit adrift. Okay, now I'm going to move on. I'm going to read an email from Sebastian. I don't know how to pronounce that in a French accent, but it's Sebastian. I'll just say Sebastian in my accent <laughs> from France. So Sebastian emailed us, uh, right around the tour started and he said, what's up, Nate? How's the tour going so far? Download looked pretty cool. Uh, will you hang out a bit at Hellfest after your show would be awesome to share a drink and discuss more about PLF and other stuff. Ah, ha, ha. I have millions of questions for you after I listen to your podcast. So a little backstory. I met Sebastian and one of his buddies in Paris last year when we were on tour with Yob and these dudes were so cool. His friend was like a total trip. Uh, and they had been to some fest and seen this band PLF, uh, who are from Texas, I think grind band and Sebastian and his friend, especially, I, f I forget your friend's name, man. I'm sorry. That dude was so fucking funny, <laughs> but he was just going off about PLF. Like just going off like so excited and blown away by that band so anyway that's the backstory there really cool guys man uh so sebastian continues anyway we'll be there first row with my spirit of drift shirt on cooking up something actually hope you like it so we're wondering the whole time like what's this dude doing he attached a picture in that email and i didn't even see it until today uh, so we're wondering, like, wonder what this dude's going to do. Uh, we got to Hellfest, played at 1130 in the morning, the morning after Motley Crue headlines. So we were thinking there was going to be nobody there. And I see Sebastian front row. I'll put a picture up. So if you look at the picture of us with the Hellfest crowd, Mike Fury somehow crouched perfectly to where you can see Sebastian and his sign. I'll put it right here. And his sign says, I don't have it in front of me, but something like, <laughs> I love Spirit Adrift even more than I love PLF. And then in parentheses, and I love PLF a lot. And dude, we were dying. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Such a great sign. So uh, thanks, Sebastian, man. That's, that's super cool. And um, I got to say, Hellfest was like the best experience of my life playing music or seeing music and i'm gonna backtrack but I'll, I'll get to hellfest so the tour started with download which used to be castle donnington fest and before that it was monsters of rock right it's been around for forever uh coolest most prestigious hard rock slash metal festival in the UK and one of the coolest ones in the world, right? 
at some point they rebranded it as download, but all the old heads, it's like, I think James from Metallica was calling it a downloading tin or something. But I have sat and watched hours of YouTube videos of bands playing Donington. You know, Metallica back in 86, Slayer 1990, uh, Seasons in the Abyss, right? After a really, really, really long tour that was supposed to already be over, they went and did, were like, fuck, we thought this tour was over and went and played Castle Donington. And there's a really endearing interview with Tom and Carrie from Slayer uh, after they got done with Donington. It was like Miss Julia interviewing him. She used to be on Fuse. She Like any Castle Donington stuff you watch, she's out there interviewing the bands. It'll be live footage and then her interviewing them. I mean, Pantera, Fear Factory, Pride and Glory, uh, you name it, right? So she's interviewing Carrie and Tom and you just see this sense of like, Carrie King is like smiling and laughing and joking around. Uh, you don't ever see him like that, you know? That just lets you know how special that that fest is. Uh, and they're just clowning so hard. Like I highly recommend looking up that interview with Tom and Carrie from 1990 because it's you just feel like their sense of accomplishment and their sense of adrenaline and the release and the relief and all of that. And we played the dog tooth stage at download, which is basically big tent. And I guess they expanded it from previous years. I've heard it was like 8,000 capacity, right? But it's outside and it was full. It was like overflowing and, uh, people were just so happy. Uh, there was a kid on his dad's shoulders right in the front. People knew the words, uh, even the people that it was clear they weren't familiar with us. They're like instantaneously into it. I knew that it was going to be good when I was just checking the mic and I was like, Hey, and the crowd goes, Hey, and I turned around and looked at my bandmates and was like, Holy shit. So then I started doing it on purpose. Right. And then I started doing like the, uh, Dio Freddie Mercury thing, you know, singing, just like a simple melody and the crowd singing it back. I'm like, holy shit, these are things that you dream of when you're watching like old Queen at Live Aid or like old Dio footage or whatever. Uh, and there I was doing it. Castle Donington. And the whole time we were playing, I, all I could think about was the vibe of Carrie King and Tom Mariah in that interview when they got done playing. Just like how euphoric those guys seem and how proud you know, and just happy. And that was just in my mind, man. Like what a, you know, it's corny to say this. The fest has been rebranded and it's, it's different and everything. But while we were playing, man, I just felt such a sense of like honor. I was just so honored to be a part of that history. And that's real, man. That's real. And I got to thank uh, Cam for getting us on that. Uh, and I did an interview while I was over there and I, I just, I sang the praises of this dude because once you get to that level, that corporate level, you know, it's very rare that um, smaller bands that aren't just massive that are out grinding in a van, uh, it's rare that that they will have any sort of inroads to something that is that massive. Uh, so a person that's able to put a band like us or Green Lung or Undeath bands like that on a, a fest that's that huge, you know, a person like that is invaluable to the timeline of heavy music. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was great, man. And Guar got moved to our day. They played right after us. So we met a few of them. Uh, Doc Coil came over to say, what's up. We were very well taken care of. I had heard mixed things about download, but our experience was nothing but positive. I mean, it was like, I'm not just saying that I would say if it sucked and it, it didn't, I mean, they took really, really good care of us. The communication was great. The accessibility to green rooms and the backstage and everything. I mean, it was super cool. Just a total honor to play there. Uh, before our set, we went over to the stage that municipal waste was playing on 
and ran into a security guard who was kind of standing by the stairs up to the, the stage. And I was like, Hey man, can we get up there? And he said, well, uh, we've kind of reached the limit of the amount of people we can allow on this stage. Fuck. Unless you're a friend of the band. And I said, I am, we are. And he goes, okay, well, if this guy in this porta potty can vouch for you, then you can go up there. And I'm like, who's in there? And Tony Foresta comes bursting out uh, of this porta potty. And he's like, yeah, I can vouch for him. These guys are my friends. And he took us up uh, to the stage and he told me, I'll take you up here, but you have to stage dive, man. And I was going to do it. And then I saw there was like a, <laughs> like a 20 foot gap between the stage and the barricades. So I was like, eh, not happening. But, um, we got to watch municipal waste. That was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. The way those dudes control a crowd and yeah, a really good set list too. And then we got to see Carcass after that. Um, we actually saw Carcass also the day before download in Birmingham. Uh, we went to the Sabbath bridge, the black Sabbath. Uh, they have like a bench in Birmingham, England with all the dudes plaques on it. Uh, and the second we sat down, here comes a metalhead, and he was like, "Are you guys spirit adrift?" <laughs> We're like, "Yeah." So we took pictures of each other on the on the bench and everything. And he told us that Carcass was playing Birmingham uh, with Unto Others and Conjurer. So you know, despite having already been up like twenty four plus hours, we went and saw Carcass. Uh, met Carl Willits from Bolt Thrower and Memoriam. Super super nice guy. Uh, so yeah, then back to. Back to download, we watched Municipal Waste and then got to see Carcass again briefly. Went and played and uh, yeah, met the Guar guys and got to see a few songs of Metallica. Uh, we had to fly out at 6 a.m., flew to Into the Grave in the Netherlands, uh, played at like 2 p.m., and it was killer. It was like completely empty when we started playing and then it just filled up. Uh, pretty quick, you know, full of people. That's a really cool fest. Again, took like really good care of us. Municipal Waste rolled up. They were at that one too. So we watched their set. Uh, I was, I had Municipal Waste riffs like stuck in my head for the whole tour. And I'm going to talk about their newest record later, Electrified Brain. Uh, great, great record. And they were opening with track two from that. And that was something that riff still humming that riff, you know? Uh, so they got done playing. We hung with them. I hung out with Nick pretty much all day that day. Uh, and really just had, had like one of those magical days. Uh, there's like a brotherhood to this whole thing that is very powerful. I, I imagine it's sort of similar to like, uh, the relationship that, guys have that have like served in war together you know what we do is not nearly as difficult or dangerous or extreme as that but it's just it's a it's a family feeling and a family vibe and uh a lot of us deal with the same challenges and the same um joyful stuff and all that and and i just had one of those days with nick and the rest of the waste dudes uh, Nick and I in particular have dealt with some very specific stuff in our lives. And, and it was just so cool to, to kick it with a dude who's basically in the exact same position in life that I am and deal with the same stuff. And you just get such comfort and joy from hanging out with, with those kind of people. Um, it pretty much felt like we were on tour with municipal ice. It was rad. We played Hellfest together too. Uh, but anyway, we knocked out into the grave I was up for 40 hours between like waking up the morning of download and going to bed the day after into the grave. I think I hit like 40 hours and I felt like I had walked out onto the edge of a cliff and was seconds away or inches away from stepping out into a void that you don't return from. It was, it was gnarly. Uh, I definitely, I definitely got a taste of like, oh, this is why some people that do this go crazy and don't, they're not ever like right in the head again, you know? Uh, and then when I laid down to go to sleep, I couldn't sleep. And I was like, 
oh my God, I've done something permanent to my brain and I am, I've lost my ability to go to sleep. But eventually I did. Everything was fine. Next day I was fine. Uh, and we did our two shows with Guar. Man, as soon as we started hanging out with him, it, it was like we were on tour already for three weeks. You know, we just like locked up really, really nice people. Like I said, we met a couple of them at Download. Uh, but the shows we played together, I mean, we were just like hitting it off instantaneously. Can't say enough nice things about them. I know that sort of ruins the uh, ruins the gig that they got going on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the monsters themselves are the worst people ever. They were saying all kinds of mean shit to us. <laughs> but uh, the the people running the organization, the humans that run the organization were all very cool people. Um, the guys that you see on stage are not, they're, they're animals, man. It's all true. Uh, also had a good time with Grove street, UK hardcore band. Really, really, really nice guys. Great band. Uh, what else, man? We were on planes and ferries and sleeping in closets and, uh, yeah, after that, we had a couple days off, slept on a farm in France with a horse and a jackass. And the lady who was renting out the Airbnb, she didn't speak English at all, but um, Tom Draper, come to find out, has some pretty functional French-speaking capabilities. And turns out she had gone to download like a year or two before. And we asked her who her favorite bands were, and she said, what, uh, Scorpions, Guns N' Roses, and Metallica. And we were like, well, shit, you probably like us. And uh, wrote her a letter, you know, and uh, took a picture with her and stuff. That was really cool. And then Hellfest. So I did an interview with Rock Hard France with this guy. And at the end of the interview, I was like, I'm really looking forward to Hellfest. And he said, you should be. You should be. I'm like, damn, that's kind of intense. Uh, you know, my... My boys and Gate Creeper played last year and they were telling me like, dude, uh, Jeff Henson, my friend in Duel, they played last year and he was like, dude, and everybody talks about how awesome it is, but just how you can't really describe it. You just have to like experience it. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, how cool can it be? I played fests. We played download. We played this and that. I've been there, done that. Used to go to Ozfest, you know, went to Sounds of the Underground back in the day. Hellfest is like the coolest fucking thing that exists in the world. <laughs> That's all I can say. It was like, if you're into metal, that is, it's heaven. It's just heaven. I mean, I don't know. I could attempt to like describe it, but. Uh, you know, we showed up the day before we played and saw, I was checking in and everything, checking in the merch and stuff like that and caught the tail end of Skid Row. It was awesome. I heard what monkey business. I remember you and youth gone wild. Okay. Possibly like my three favorite Skid Row songs. <laughs> I mean, straight up. Those are my favorite Skid Row songs. So I'm like, all right, not a bad start. Uh, saw a couple other bands and then. We watched Def Leppard. Incredible. Uh, the drummer is missing a fucking limb and played one of the most incredible drum solos you could ever hear. And it, it was just like <clears throat> the response of the people that, I mean, there's like a hundred thousand something plus people there, I guess. And the response and the love that he got from that crowd uh, there was just so much being transmitted between that guy and the crowd and an appreciation of like, do you know what kind of person you'd have to be to be a drummer and lose a limb and then just keep going, like figure out a way to just keep going. You can't imagine the type of individual it would take to just be like, you know what? Fuck my arm. I don't need that. Like, let's make pyromania. Let's make one of the best selling rock albums Ever. One of the best selling albums, period. Let's just be one of the most successful bands ever. Fuck that arm. You know, the type of attitude and the type of uh, 
I don't know. You just got to be an animal, man. And when he played that solo and the response the crowd gave, it's like, that's what everybody was acknowledging, you know, hundred thousand plus whatever people. And he looked like he was going to cry. I felt like I was going to cry. It was just like, there was a, a tangible love and excitement in the air that you can only get from having that many people in one place for a common purpose. And that's what you can't describe with words. But that's when I felt like, holy shit, this is what everybody's talking about. Oh, my God. Um, so then we we went back to our little closet hotel and came back the next day, played super early. Uh, amazing. Like, I guess probably the best, coolest and best show the band's ever played. Felt so much love. Um, we were concerned again because it was 1130 in the morning and Motley Crue had just played the night before. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. That's what Jeff Henson told me. It's like, man, we're playing at like 1130. He's like, don't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. Just wait, man. <laughs> just wait. And he was right. Um, just die hard, man. It's, uh, it's a whole lot of people showing up to like the most metal place on earth. Uh, every single inch of that place is metal. They have a giant bronze Lemmy statue with a cigar that actually smokes. They have like giant demon metal demon shit all over the place and sculptures. And there's a wall with portraits of all the rock and metal heroes that have played there that have passed on, you know, it's not attempting to be anything else. And that's super common right now is like, you know, not knocking download at all, but download was always a metal fest and it's, it's sort of um, adapting to the current times. And I get that. I get that. Sometimes you have to do that, but health fest is not that they don't give a fuck, man. That place is metal period. And what's astounding. And we talked about it a lot to have that many people there and a lot of them are super fucked up on drugs and alcohol <laughs> and I didn't witness none of us witnessed one second of anybody acting out of pocket or uh, anybody being aggressive or any fights or any arguments or any uh, any negativity really that's astounding that's astounding. I mean, that's truly, it it's, gives you hope for humanity to experience something like that. It's like, man, 99.9% .9 of people just want to live their lives and do what they love and have a good time. You know, um, if there's one band that ever existed that I would choose to see at Hellfest, it's Iron Maiden. And we got to see Iron Maiden. <laughs> Uh, the first Maiden CD I got when I was a kid, right when it came out, was Rock and Rio. I had heard them, you know, but that's the first one that I actually went out and bought. And I wore that thing out and I watched the DVD and just watching a, a sea, a literal sea of people singing along like maiden has so many sing-along parts not just vocals but guitar stuff like they write guitar stuff with the express purpose of being a sing-along part right and listening to that rock and rio and they mix the crowd mics up loud as fuck on that original mix which they've since remixed and it's not as good hearing those people sing the choruses sing the guitar lines clapping screaming watching the DVD and see hundreds of bodies crowd surfing and stuff like that. I got to see that for real at Hellfest. And it, it was just like the hair on your arms is standing up. You got goosebumps. We were up a couple stories and, uh, you know, I'm looking over one shoulder and there's away from Voivod look over the other shoulder. And it's like the Zulu dudes and the soul glow dudes and municipal waste. And, uh, dudes from Svalbard. I mean, it was just like, it was a party and it was just, everybody was having the best day of their life. You know, uh, fear of the dark, just watching hundreds of bodies 
all crowd surfing at the same time. Um, you know, they were playing, they were focusing on the new album, but also somewhere in time, which is that or power slave are my favorite maiden albums. But I, most of the time I lean somewhere in time and, you know, they open with the first two songs. They played heaven can wait. Alexander the Great, Wasted Years, Closed with Wasted Years. I've never gotten to see them play that song. Obviously, never gotten to see them play those other songs from somewhere in time. Uh, it was, yeah, you know, seeing Black Sabbath, original lineup, Slayer, original lineup, Judas Priest, original lineup when I was 16 at OzFest. That was pretty magical. Uh, but I have to say, I think this experience at Hellfest was even better. Uh, especially being fortunate enough to actually be able to participate in it as a performer. You know, it was just really, it was the coolest thing I've ever done. So glad we went. Um, and Mike Fury and I flew back home and we're up for about 24 hours and our wives picked us up and we went straight to Oblivion Access Festival and saw... I saw like the last uh, three, two, three minutes of Yob set and got to catch up with the Paul Bear guys and the Yob guys uh, and then came home and slept for two days. So that was our European adventure. Really like one of the greatest experiences of my life. Got to meet Steve Harris briefly. How cool is that? Saw so many friends. Let's see. I'm going to throw some pictures up there. Uh, finally got to meet Isaiah from Earthless probably my favorite living guitar player i've been like obsessed with this dude since the live at roadburn album i listened to that like every day when i lived in arkansas and meeting this guy it was like we knew each other already for a year 10 years 20 years i don't know kindred spirits uh ran into the old boy wino <laughs> love wino we sat on a Marshall amp side by side and watched a little bit of Earthless. That was something I won't forget anytime soon. Uh, of course, saw the Crowbar dudes, got to catch up with uh, Uncle Kirk there. Um, yeah, I mean, saw saw Weed Eater crush the Valley stage the day before we played at Hellfest and uh, caught Shep. Me and Shep... Um, Saw a dude die in a motorcycle accident in Little Rock one time. There's a really gnarly story there, but that's kind of always been our weird connection. You know, we we're drinking whiskey in my car and got out of the car to go watch Wake and bam, saw some of the gnarliest shit ever. And I'll never forget Shep's reaction. All these people were freaking out, screaming and everything. And Shep just went, God damn, and then walked outside. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Hellfest was like a big family reunion, you know, really good time. Okay, I'm going to go back to some fan mail. This is a long one here. Uh, a couple people just saying nice stuff. Bo from Texas said, hey man, I can't get enough of your podcast. I'm a massive fan of Spirit Adrift. I've been turning all my friends onto the band and my favorite jams. This is why I had to read this one. The first time I heard Sorcerer's Fate, man, I straight up cried because it helped me realize how much I love music and that I need to keep playing guitar as much as possible. It gave me the realization that I should turn my love for music into a pursuit as opposed to an escape. Much love from a fellow Texan. Bo, I love you, man. I'm, I'm honored to be able to, I don't know, be even a little part of making somebody want to want to play music and want to play metal specifically, you know, first time I heard black Sabbath, it was over for me, man. And all I want to do is, uh, keep that going. You know, I love this type of music so much and yeah, give it a shot, man. Uh, see what happens. And I, I again, I'm just, that's very surreal and I'm honored. I'm honored, man. Thank you. I uh, also heard from Anthony from Texas. I think I mistook Anthony for his buddy. Uh, saw your podcast yesterday morning, and I was a dude who bought you the Topo Chico, right? Um, and then he talks about knowing Rodney from Devastation for a long time. I'm going to get Rodney on this podcast for sure. I think they're home now. 
dude, I just wanted to let you know that I'm really digging the pod and love the energy of the band. I'm an old school rock and metal guy. And as I get older, I tend to just listen to the same shit over and over. And it takes something of substance to really catch my ear. I immediately found that in your music. The heaviness, but melodic sound. Tasteful solos, and of course the great use of those harmonies. Your shit is a whole package. Keep that up. And we never had that Thin Lizzy trivia. I was yelling at Anthony on stage in Denton because he had a Thin Lizzy shirt on. And I was like, me, you, and Rodney can do Thin Lizzy trivia back at the merch table. Because that's me and Rodney, one of our favorite bands. Uh, dude, thanks, Anthony. I know what you're talking about, man. As we get older, it's like... Especially right now, it seems like I'm not really hearing music that's has the same qualities as the stuff I grew up on. So I'm just trying to be that. I'm just trying to make that music that that I grew up on. My version of it, obviously, um, an updated, relevant version of it. Uh, but I really appreciate that, man. And that seems to be a theme of this podcast as well. You know, I asked everybody... Who do you want us to tour with? Are there newer bands that you think I would dig? That sort of thing. And so I got some messages along those lines as well that I'm going to read right now. Steven in Newcastle, UK. Sorry we couldn't make it up there, man. A lot of confusion with that whole deal, but we will one day soon. Steven says, you mentioned something along the lines of missing newer bands with strong, clean singing and great guitar solos. Not sure if you're aware of them, but can I recommend you check out Green Long? Funny you should say that, Stephen. I love Green Long. Uh, the first time I became aware of them was when we did that Black Sabbath Volume 4 tribute. Our first choice of uh, the song we wanted to do was Snowblind, but they told us at the time that Bongzilla had picked that one, and obviously seniority. Bongzilla's been around for forever, so we ended up doing Supernaut. But I guess something happened. Bongzilla couldn't do it. And I saw this band Green Lung got it. And as much as I love Bongzilla, love the dudes, love their music, I'm a huge fan. I was like, man, I hope this band Green Lung has clean vocals just because there's so many really amazing vocal melodies in Snowblind. And it turns out they do. And I was a huge fan of their take on that song. And then I think Woodland Rights came out. And I was pretty blown away by that album. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of Green Lung. They just signed with Nuclear Blast. Word on the street is the new record is just like a straight up arena rock record, <laughs> which is cool. I'm sure, I mean, take that with a grain of salt. Obviously, it's going to sound like Green Lung. Uh, but what's funny is Tom from Green Lung and I have been in touch about doing some shows together. And I don't really have details just yet. I don't want to talk about it too much. But I think we're going to try and do some European stuff together. And I personally would love to get them over to the States, help them out with that, uh, with gear or whatever, you know, anything to, to facilitate that, because I think that would be a really cool tour for the fans. And I would love to see that band every night. So, yeah, uh, we'll. No matter what, we will be doing some shows with Green Long at some point. Uh, Renee mentioned some bands for us to tour with Municipal Waste and Night Demon uh, I'm going to talk some more about Municipal Waste 100% yeah that would be killer love those guys uh, Night Demon too yeah we've played some shows together uh, Jarvis is a great friend and a great dude and they're a great band and I think that would work very well uh, Quinn from Indianapolis mentions Cave In and Mutoid Man Steve Brodsky, obviously, great guy. In certain pictures, we look very similar. I saw a picture of him when I was on tour one day, and I thought it was a picture of me from the night before. It was really weird. Uh, love Mutoid Man. Quinn mentions that Jeff Matz is in that band now. Jeff's a great guy. Uh, love High on Fire, too. Obviously, you know they're on the list, right? So, yeah, these are all great, great, great recommendations. Um, we, we were talking about touring with cave in around the time of COVID and it, it didn't end up happening, obviously. Uh, so yeah, any one of those bands is a strong possibility, but especially green lung, we actually like have the ball rolling with that. So we'll see what happens. 
All right, I'm going to read one more piece of fan mail before I talk about municipal waste, electrified brain, and share an old, old story about the first time I hung out with those dudes. It's a really good story. <laughs> All right. David from Manchester, UK, has an I shall return theory. Nobody's got it yet. Nobody's got it. He has a couple, actually. One of them, he says, is it something to do with your album covers? Curse of Conception could be at the base or top of a mountain. Divided, the characters carrying a flame. And I assume your new album has an eagle owl on the front. I didn't even think of any of that, dude. That all seems like it could be right, but it's not. Sorry. Um, oh, okay. David also said uh, that he struggles to get out of the Manchester area and asks if we'll please visit, and I hope we do. But he said he hopes to take his eldest daughter to see us as we are her favorite band since 2020, and she's five years old now. And, man, uh, that's another thing that gives me a lot of hope, dude. Hell yeah. Um, all right. Sorry, sentimentality moment. <laughs> so David's second theory is that this is a uh, I Shall Return as a dedication to the song Rocky Mountain Way by the Eagles. Are you carrying the flame onward or is it a reference to the lyric Open Fire or reference to your album cover from Divided by Darkness? Uh, technically, that's a Joe Walsh song. I love Joe Walsh. I was always kind of hot and cold with the Eagles. I saw that documentary and loved it so much. It gave me kind of like a new level of respect for them. I love all the guys' solo stuff. Just something about... And, and I love the uh, Seven Bridges Road vocal harmony thing that they do. And uh, But I'm a huge, huge Joe Walsh fan. Like James Gang and all the solo Joe Walsh stuff. Uh, he was a guy, actually, that when I was worried about not being cool anymore when I got sober, he, him and like Waylon Jennings and Buzz from the Melvins, a couple other dudes, but, but Joe Walsh was a big one where I was like, dude, Joe Walsh is sober and he's the coolest motherfucker in the world. So don't worry about it. Unfortunately, your theory is wrong, but that's the closest anybody's gotten. You're like very close. Uh, all right, there's going to be an edit there because my dog's dinner alarm went off and stopped the video. So the answer to the I Shall Return theory is in the podcast episode where I talked about the origins of that song. Um, and I'm talking about listening to FM radio from Tucson to Austin. So I go through a, a few cities or go near a few cities between Tucson and Austin listening to FM radio. And that's the key to figuring out the uh, inside joke of that song. So good luck, David. You were very close, man. All right. Now I'm going to talk about electrified brain by municipal waste. Hazardous mutation came out when I was maybe 16 years old and I was obsessed from the get go. I love that album. That's an album where I feel like, every single riff on it and every single second of it is badass. I mean, it's just like top tier thrash metal crossover, whatever you want to call it. Brilliant stuff. Um, and it's kind of hard to beat what you hear when you're 16, 17, 18 years old. But I will say, I think electrified brain is my second favorite municipal waste record. Uh, and if I had heard this one when I was 16, it might very well be my favorite. Uh, they brought a lot of melody and epic guitar harmony stuff that they hadn't really quite incorporated before. Uh, you know, Ryan and Nick play in a band together called Bat, which is kind of more traditional metal. And I feel like they brought that to it. Uh, their songwriting has always been like top tier. Uh, and I think Phil has a lot more to do with that than people realize. Uh, we've talked about different tricks like modulating up a full step in certain parts and stuff. But I'm talking like songwriting, not riff writing. Obviously, the guys can write riffs. No question. Uh, anybody can write a riff, but can you write a song? Municipal Waste can do both. 
uh, Tony, I mean, you got to put him in the top five thrash vocalists ever at this point. Um, on record and, and live, especially the way he commands a crowd just by being himself. He, there's no character. There's no cliche frontman bullshit stuff that let me fucking hear you make some none of that bullshit. He's Tony and people love him. Everybody loves Tony. I love Tony and crowds of people that watch me Waste ways love Tony. They do whatever the hell he tells them to do. It's amazing. It's very inspiring to see. Uh, Dave Whitty on drums, obviously a total legend, one of the best drummers in metal. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, it's, it's kind of strange for me because they still seem, it's like what, uh, I think Anthony was his name was talking about as you get older, you just kind of freeze up on, on the stuff that you like. So in a way, Municipal Ways still kind of seems like a new ish band to me and they're not at all they've been around for more than 20 years and when i sort of forced myself to realize that i was like oh you have to put them in the top five thrash bands of all time or i do uh yeah i mean they've never stopped playing balls to the wall thrash metal ever they've never wavered uh, this is album number seven, I guess. So think about every other thrash band that's like legendary. Think about what they were doing on album number seven. And it can get pretty ugly. Municipal Waste is putting out potentially the best album of their, of their career. And uh, these guys were nice enough to give me a copy in the Netherlands. I'm very grateful. I fucking love this album. It was recorded by our friend Arthur. Shout out Arthur. Everything he does is great. And I want to tell a story about the first time I saw Municipal Waste and the first time I met them. I was a senior in high school in Oklahoma. They were playing a place called the Observatory or Conservatory. I can't remember. In Oklahoma City, there was a record store next door, and it was St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and this was right after Hazardous Mutation came out. Uh, the thing about Oklahoma at the time was beer was all under 3.2% alcohol, so it just sucked. It didn't do shit. You have to drink 30 beers to, to get any kind of buzz. So I had a fake ID, and I lived sort of close to the Kansas border. I drove up over the border, bought two cases of this beer called Beer 30. It's in a purple box. Uh, it looked like grape soda, basically. <laughs> Uh, cause it's real beer. It was above 3.2%, you know? And then me and my buddies drove to Oklahoma city, uh, showed up a little bit early, went in the record store. And I remember I bought a blue cheer Vincibus eruptum white shirt that I wore for quite a few years. But looking at records in the record store, uh, was Tony from municipal waste. And I said, Hey man, are you Tony? He said, yeah. I said, cool. Well, I don't know if you know, but beer in Oklahoma sucks. And I went to Kansas and bought 60 beers for you guys. Do you want to drink them? And he was like, hell yeah. <laughs> so we got in the van uh, and it was me. I don't think Witty was in the van. But it was me, uh, a couple of my friends, Landfill, Tony, and Ryan from Municipal Waste. And we listened to Man of War and we're drinking beers just hanging out. It's cool. Minus the beer thing. It's just like what the last week was like with them. Just hanging out, bullshitting, having a great time. I remember, uh, Ryan asked me who my favorite bands were. And I said, uh, black Sabbath and black flag. And he was like, dude, you got to check out our friends annihilation time. Cause they were like 50, 50 and annihilation time ended up becoming one of my favorite bands discovered them through Ryan, you know, uh, and then they played and it was totally incredible. Uh, and I just, I worshiped that band, man. And there was a moment watching Iron Maiden at Hellfest towards the end of their set. And I looked down and there was Ryan from Municipal Waste. And I just thought like, you know, I get caught up in, in, I'm very goal oriented. And I get caught up in like 
Schwarzenegger was talking about it on his new uh, documentary. When he reaches the the peak, he's like, where's the next one? He doesn't take one second to be like, wow, I can't believe I just accomplished that. And I really relate to that, man. I, I don't either. I reach a peak and I'm like, where's the next one? And that's good and bad. It's good because you can really achieve a lot and, and be proud of what you're achieving and all that. But you're kind of not having fun. And you're kind of not um, giving yourself the acknowledgement or, or allowing yourself to feel the, the joy of having reached a really seemingly unattainable goal, you know. But there was a moment watching Iron Maiden when I looked down and saw Ryan and I flashed back to being 18 years old in the van with Municipal Waste. This is 17 years ago. And I'm like, dude, if I could only go back and tell that 18 year old version of me, like, okay, this band that you look up to in 17 years, you're going to be hanging out with them, but it's going to be in France with like a hundred something thousand people watching Iron Maiden. And both of your bands will have played that day too. I just wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed you. And it was very precious to me to be able to have that moment of realization of like, holy shit, I can't believe this. And you know what? Those guys in municipal waste probably wouldn't have believed it back then either. You know, these are the things that we really uh, make a lot of sacrifices and put in a lot of hard work for. Uh, So I love metal, man. I love music. I love metal. I love Iron Maiden. I love municipal waste. And I love anybody that's listening to this, supporting all this insanity. And I will uh, see you next episode. Thanks, guys.